Lord, we indeed pray that you raise us to that heavenly table where we can tower with you in your son Jesus Christ. That the philosophies of this world, that the legalism of religion may not hold us captives, but that we may allow ourselves to reign with Christ high up there to enjoy freedom and victory that you alone can give. So, as I open up the truth of your word, may you speak to each one of us in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, Iskalin and the team uh, that have been leading us for a wonderful uh, leadership and great worship. Uh, it's long really since I was in the youth church. I realized that since I was last here, uh, a lot of gifts have sprouted and they're being displayed to the glory of God. I also note that since I was last here, uh, we have preferred sitting on the mezzanine uh, to the ground floor, all to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. I publish the bands of marriage between Michael Orengo of All Saints, uh, Kamunde Maseno West Diocese, and Margaret Samantha Luceno of Friends Church Ngong, Ngong Road, uh, between Joseph Guitar Reader of St. Paul's University Chapel, and Barbara Auma Abuoga of All Saints Cathedral for the third time of announcing. If I mention your name and you're here, please stand. Also, uh, for the second time of announcing, we published the bounds of marriage between Ambassador Richard Philip Owade and Marino Pio Koja, both of All Saints Cathedral, and for the first time of announcement uh, between Brian Christopher Odongo and Samantha Jambi Mugo, both of All Saints Cathedral, and between John Keegan Chelimo of All Saints Cathedral and Lisa Cherotich Maru of Emmanuel Baptist and Mark Maingi of City Revival Temple, and Sarah Dolin Omondi of Destiny Family Church. If there is anyone who knows any just cause why these couples shouldn't be joined together in holy matrimony, please, may you make that known uh, to us formally. If those people are around, please may you rise up so that we may commend you to the Lord. Are they there? All right. Uh, some of them, I guess, are in the other congregation. Um, so that I keep to the times, timelines that I'm given, our topic for today is uh, the danger of religious legalism. Last week, um, my good brother Edward uh, Kireti uh, taught us about the danger of human philosophy, uh, philosophies from uh, verse 1 to verse 10 of chapter 2 of Colossians. I build on there and looking at verse 11 to verse 17 and we look at the danger of religious legalism. If you asked me, if I was a journalist like some of you, to give you a snippet of, uh, of these verses as a headline, so my headline would be, uh, only Jesus gives us freedom so that we can live victoriously. Only Jesus gives us freedom so that we can live victoriously. So that would be my breaking news. That would be my newspaper headline. In this passage, I set out a background, then I bring three quick teachings within the span of time that I am allocated. In this context, the background to this uh, portion, not the book, the background to this section is that there were so many false teachings as elsewhere that were threatening uh, the church in Colos. And those um, false teachings revolved around things like astrology. So you know astrology. Astrology is basically the study of movements and positions of uh, uh, celestial bodies up there, like planets, moons, stars, etc., 
and seeking to interpret um, how they influence human affairs. That because Gemini means that your life will be like this today. And if uh, Capricorn, uh, you are Cap born during Capricorn, it means this one. So that's an example of astrology. So false teachings were propagating that by studying those um, uh, celestial beings, uh, bodies, we are able then to locate the patterns of our lives and draw blessings from there, which was false. Some of them were around philosophies, as Kireti did teach last time, that when you possess a level of knowledge, then you are able to break into a deeper level of understanding God and being spiritual and connecting with him deeper. That was actually wrong as well. But also legalism. So we have different types of legalism here. Legalism is about kufuata sharia, uh, ordering around rules and regulations. So there was Jewish uh, legalism, which Paul rebukes in Galatians, that was read to us. Galatians outlined that a lot more. Maybe I'll mention quick uh, in a short while. But then there was also Gnostic, Gnostic legalism. So Gnostic legalism, um, which pushed that if you are a believer, then you must also do certain things as required by the law for you to be properly saved. So in this section, Paul actually is fighting both Jewish and Gnostic legalism. He takes them head on and insists that Jesus is supreme to the law and that freedom and victory are not found in observing the law but in believing in our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Judaizers, the propagators of legalism were saying that you must, once you become a believer, remember, there were Jews and there were non-Jews. So Jews were observing the law. So non-Jews who are called the Gentiles, when you got saved, when you met Jesus, then the Judaizers insisted that you must also begin to observe the, Moses, the laws of Moses so that your salvation is complete. If you don't observe, then it is not complete. Paul is telling them that Jesus is sufficient. We don't need an extra uh, for us uh, then to get properly saved. Uh, and then you see that being expounded and expounded. So Paul is saying that please look at Jesus. Don't look at those other things. Because the entire book of Colossians exalts the supremacy and the preeminence of Christ that him alone is sufficient. Remember in chapter 16, in chapter 8, in, chapter, in verse 8, chapter 2. He had rebuked them not to be taken captives to philosophies and teachings that are inappropriate. So as we gather here, we must be aware that even in our time today, there are people who insist on legal orders, on regulations to govern our Christian lives without which they say, then you are not properly a believer. I recently had a pastor from Nigeria say that when you tithe, then you will go to heaven express. Many of you heard that. It is a very fresh teaching. About a month ago, two months ago. You remember that? That those who tithe will go to heaven express. The danger there then is that we set aside Jesus Christ as the only savior and introduce human made things which cannot save us. We dislodge Jesus from his position as the savior. A church that teaches that, therefore should drop Jesus. They should drop calling themselves Christians because to be a Christian means to follow what Christ taught. In our time today, we also have many people who bring in uh, many teachings, many, many teachings, whether they're cultural, whether they're traditional or tribal, or whether they're uh, neo teachings that seek to bring convenience and comfort today. Uh, where I come from, They'll say that uh, uh, if your father dies, then you must take three days. After three days, then you are shaved. Uh, 
you don't go anywhere, you are shaved uh, and all that. Then if it's a woman, I don't know, there's one which is four days, another one is three days, I can't remember. Um, that if a man dies, then a male animal must be slaughtered first. And if it's a female person, like a, ma a woman, then a female animal must be slaughtered first. You know, all those teachings, uh, there are so many, especially if you cross the Rift Valley going that side, uh, across Western and Lua Nyanza, there are lots of those teachings which are traditional. They say that if you're, the, if you're, if you're building uh, a simba or uh, building a new home, you must carry an axe uh, or you must carry a cork, a jogo, uh, so that your home is blessed. They bring in so many teachings. If your husband dies as a woman, there's this order that you must follow for you to be uh, cleansed. Friends, I'm afraid that believers fall for these things because we are threatened that if you don't follow them, then we are going to die. If you come from central Kenya, they'll tell you that you must give a goat for you to be sufficiently a man um, without which then you will not be a proper man. If your mom was never paid for dowry, then you cannot receive dowry and all those sorts of things. Friends, those things were brought in African context to bring in order and to bring in a sense of respect. But they are not salvific in them. They don't carry salvation. So the moment you begin to be fearful, to be terrified, and to refuse to do what God wants you to do in scripture, and to look for culture and what your grandfathers and the elders are saying, then you have dislodged Jesus. You have set him aside and have brought other things to be at the very center. I hear, oh, my first, my first sister did not, has not married, so I cannot marry, or oh, my parents cannot receive dowry because of X and Y and Z. Because two of my older brothers are not married as a third brother, I cannot get married. All those shenanigans. I wonder, kama mtu wa mezuba hataki kuwawa, sasa, we utangoja tu mpaka hile siku hii watu, watawa at 50, na ume pata karembo kako. Jameni, Yesu anatuweka huru. Na ndiyo mana, Paulo anapu andikia huko losaya na wambia, Yesu anatosha. Tusi mchanganyishe, tusi changanyishe maisha na vitu hivi vya dunia. Yesu anatosha. Unapu mfuata kristo basi, Kristo anakuelekeza katika maisha ya uhuru na maisha ya ushindi. Many people who follow those things live very miserable lives. I see them in my village and I don't admire at all. So that is really the background. Now, when you come to verse 1, uh, verse 11 uh, to verse 13, that is my first division, verse 11 to verse 13 of Colossians. Let's now go into the book. Chapter 2, verse 11 to verse 13, is, it talks there about the issue of circumcision in verse 11, um, he says, in verse 11, that if your hands are there, uh, you also were circumcised with him, with a circumcision made without hands. So, the Judaizers were insisting that non-Judaizers must go for the cut. They must go for real physical circumcision for them to be proper believers. But Paul is telling them, no, when Jesus came, then all of us were circumcised. And a circumcision, he refers to here, is not the one done by human hands, but the one that involves putting off the old self and putting on the new self. Do you know what he's saying here? That the greatest thing that happened to you when you came to know Jesus is that a transformation happened inside of you. That is what he calls circumcision. Because circumcision, as we'll see in a little while, borders and parallels baptism. So he says, when you accept Jesus, there is an inner transformation that has happened inside of you and that is what he refers to as circumcision. It, is, it means taking away of the old self, the sinful self, and then, as we see in verse 12 and 13, being clothed with a new self. Nikomanisha kwamba, if you are a thief, when you meet Jesus, then as you encounter Christ, Christ removes the instincts of thievery and stealing and then plants in you a spirit and a heart of contentment. So that is what circumcision here means. If you are a drunkard, then he removes that at salvation. If you are a sexually moral person at salvation, he removes that and then plants in you a spirit of purity. So he says... When you are circumcised, 
when you, when you came to faith, you were circumcised in him. Don't look for another circumcision. Don't go to be cut. It doesn't mean that if you are a Kisi, if you are a Bukusu, or if you are a Meru, and they practice cultural cutting, it is an offense. It simply means that if you want to exalt the cutting thing over Jesus, then it becomes an offense. If you want to practice it either for purposes of health or hygiene or, or to distinguish age sets, as Christians, we say, go ahead and do that. But don't make circumcision to be the main thing. In verse 12 and verse 13, he tells them that you, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh. And God made you alive together with him. You see, all of that, where he mentions baptism, he mentions circumcision, he mentions deadness to your old flesh and resurrection to a new life, he means that when we get saved, then God makes us anew in Jesus Christ. You are made new person. So the concept of baptism that he uses there has three meanings. First meaning is to dip, which is to immerse. You can be immersed in water, or dipped in water, or you can be dip yourself in, 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 in mud or in smoke. So to, to baptize is to immerse. Secondly, and from a figurative perspective, it means to identify with Jesus. So baptism there, secondly, means to identify with Jesus, to move on the side of Jesus. It means I'm moving away from my cultural bondages or from servitude of Satan and I'm taking the side of Jesus. So that is what it means. When you get saved, unavuka pande wake Yesu Christ. Unavuka simama na Yesu. But spiritually, baptism there then means inner spiritual transformation akin to what I'd explained about, uh, about um, circumcision, where the old nature is taken away and then the new nature is given to you. In Ezekiel uh, chapter uh, 36 verse 24, uh, Ezekiel prophesies and says, in those days I will send my spirit and then I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So that is what happens at salvation. That God removes the evil heart of stone and sin. The one that likes to sin. The one that when they see for men a naked person or, or, or even breasts of a woman, they begin to, uh, the body begins to want. A woman, when you see a man who has biceps, then the body begins to change. He says, when you encounter Christ, he deals with that, that seat of lust, that seat of evil. And then a new spirit is planted in you. Do you know what Paul is telling them here? That we have two natures as believers. We have two natures in each one of us. The old nature and the new nature. So, so the nature that you feed is the nature that will thrive. Is the nature that will flourish. So if I am a believer, like my good friend and brother Patrick Lumumba here, but then I keep feeding myself, with watching pornography, for example, um, going for keroke. You know what keroke? Ile dance dance. You know what I mean? Yo yo yo. Karaoke. Oh man, away. Karaoke. Going for karaoke. Um, or if I keep the company of conmen or thieves, then. Their actions, the actions that surround me will cause, will stir up the old self in me and begin to flourish. And that is why as a believer, when you are a believer, you are encouraged to emulate and associate with and be in place where good things happen. But on the contrary, if I'm a believer, that I'm in fellowship of believers, I'm, 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 I'm being mentored by other people, I watch good things, then the self in me that will flourish is the new self. So two natures. I don't know which one you want to feed. The more you feed it, the more you watch porn under the blanket, the more you stir up that other self. So 2 Corinthians chapter 13 is a reminder that once we accept Jesus as our savior, we are therefore to live as believers. That is what Paul is telling them here. You accepted Jesus as your savior, please live as believers, not as non-believers. When we do so, then 
the legalism, the philosophies of our time will not have a place in you. I want to encourage you, a campus student, if you are here, I want to encourage you, a young adult who's begun work, you're in a workspace where every philosophy and teaching is going on, please, could you stand for Jesus? Could you take a stand on the side of Christ and stand for him? When people tell you there that as a young person, as a young man, Nilazima went a test drive because if you don't go for test drive, then the transformer will not be working. You won't know whether the transformer is working. Lazima wende ufanya test drive. Tafadhali ukiwa kwenye Yesu, hayo mafundisho utayasukuma kando na utajua kwamba mwito wako kama aliyeokoka ni kuwa kuwa pure to remain pure and to keep your zip up. Ukatelie na password na usipeane. By the time now you get to meet your right person, then you enjoy within the context of marriage. So if you are there and you've been sidetracked by legalism or false teachings, please know Paul is inviting us to recognize that we must live as believers and demonstrate that wherever we are. Even when you are invited for sleepovers, please define boundaries. Even when you are applying for tender, a government tender, please define boundaries. Be willing to pay the price, the ultimate price of being a believer. But when the Lord now later chooses to bless you, he will bless you maradufu. See what tunaimba dabo dabo? Tunaimba ngapi ngapi? Dabo dabo. When the Lord chooses to bless you because of your faithfulness, he will bless you dabo dabo. So that's number one. Number two, from verse 13, uh, C to verse 15, do you know what Paul is saying here? That we have been set free from the law, from sin, and from Satan. Therefore, we must live victoriously and don't allow Satan to engage us again. Let's just see that uh, a little more. Uh, verse 13, the last part of it, he says, He forgave us, having forgiven us our trespasses by canceling the cord uh, of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside. NIV says he canceled, nailing it to the cross. Verse 15. Then he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame uh, by triumphing over them in him. What Paul is saying here is that, number one, Jesus forgave us our sins and our trespasses. Whether we have accepted him or not, forgiveness is available at the cross of Christ. But if you have agreed that Jesus forgave you and you have accepted him as your savior, then that forgiveness is available at the cross there. You don't need to do anything else to earn forgiveness from the Lord. His blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary is sufficient. You need not to follow the law uh, to, be, to be redeemed. He's saying because Jesus canceled the debt of unforgiveness and our sins that stood against us. Let me explain this from a Jewish context. Do you know, in Jewish terms, when you made mistakes, they were remembered and stored. And that is why there are several levels of sacrifices, including others that were carried out only once every year. But he's also paralleling this to uh, financial debts. That if you had a financial debt, then that was written on an animal skin called a parchment where it was remembered. Ukona deni hivi. Ukona deni hivi. Ndivyo vile, ukiwitenda dambi, zilikuwa, zina, zina kumbukwa na zina wekwa kwenye mahali pa kumbu kumbu. What Paul is saying, when you accept Jesus, all those are taken away. He forgives and he cancels. Did you read the word? He cancels the written code that stood against us. Can I tell you two things? One, there is no amount of sin that the Lord cannot forgive. There is no amount of sin that Jesus cannot forgive. You may have made mistakes. You may have found yourself in a sinful situation. But the gospel reminds us this morning that Jesus loves you and that he is not present to judge you, but is available to forgive you. Maybe you feel dirty and filthy because of what you did this night or this week. And you feel you are unqualified to earn his love and salvation. He says in John chapter 3 verse 17 that the son of man did not come into the world to condemn the world. But that the world may be saved through him. That people will judge you. That people will come for your neck. 
they went for Rikiji's neck. But Jesus will forgive you. I don't know what sins or mistakes Rikiji committed that our parliamentarians and other people have not committed. But Jesus will forgive you. He will not remember once you say, I am sorry. So the password is to say, I am sorry, Lord, then the Lord forgives you. But the second thing from verse 13 and 14 is that he canceled. That canceling means there are debts that were taken on your behalf by your parents and forefathers that constantly stand against you and they keep calling on your soul. Do you know, if you study human life, you look at the things that happened to your grandfather, happened to your father, and they're happening to you. you. Look at the things that are happening to your siblings. Some, you can see a pattern and parallel them with your uncles, both from your mother's side or from your father's side. When people in our lineage who did not accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior committed sins or covenants with the devil, the blood or objects of covenant that were used to make those covenants and agreements remain alive to date. They remain alive to date. And that's why they keep calling. They keep calling. Those curses keep calling and following. Hasua wale ambao pengine kwenye jamii yenu walikufa bila kuolewa, wanapotazama wanaona haka kasichana kanarembeka, kanasonga karibu na haka kijana kama pate kimani hapa kana kuwa potential ya kuolewa. Pepo wanainuka kutoka kule ambapo wameketi na kusema kwamba haka kasichana kata olewa na wanaharibu. And that, you see those patterns building, joblessness, po patterns of poverty. You see patterns of death, immature deaths. I saw them in my mother's house. I saw them in my family. Building and building and creating those patterns. What Paul is saying here is that when you accept Jesus Christ, he gives you the power to claim freedom from the demands of the enemy to fulfill those and he cancels the written code that stand against you that you must fulfill those things. So that is the beauty of salvation. That is why somebody like Evans can stand here authoritatively under the authority of Christ because I was freed from family and ancestral curses and bondages and patterns. And so you could be here but maybe the Lord desires that you become the chain broker you become the pattern broker, breaker in your family. The one who breaks those patterns. The one who sets in a new lease of life. I became in my family. You could be here and this word is basically for you. That you identify with Jesus so strongly without playing around with sin. Stand on his side so firmly. Pay that price. Then the Lord will release you. You will see freedom. And you will see victory in him. Amen. And so whereas the world condemns and remembers people's sins and mistakes and crucifies them for those, Jesus Christ, our Savior, wipes away all our sins and invites us into fellowship when we repent. And so no matter how deep or dark your sins are, I know of a Savior who will always forgive you. And finally, in verse 15, a lot go to the rest. Verse 15, he says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them in the open shame, triumphing over them by the cross. Do you know what Paul is saying here? One, he's canceled those debts. One, he's, one, he's forgiven us. Number two, he's canceled every written code against us. And then number three, he makes a public triumph over the devil. Do you know what that simply means? It means... Jesus ties Satan and disarms him completely. That all his weapons are confiscated and rendered powerless. That Satan cannot rise against you to fight you unless you give him permission through sin. That is what that verse means, verse 15. That when you are in Jesus and you live righteously, then you're insulated, you're protected from the attacks of the enemy because you are in a cover. You're like in a military camp because already Jesus has defeated Satan, disarmed him, and he's made a public declaration over him that he's a defeated fella. 
So Satan is a defeated fellow, friends. He says, in NIV version says, he made a public triumph over him, shamefully walking him before people. So, the next time you wanted to collude with Satan, the next time you wanted to listen to legalism, whether the philosophies from Mount Kenya, or they're the philosophies from Mount Ramogi, or they're the ones from uh, Kakamega Forest, from those elders, remember that you're inviting a defeated fella to control your life. The day you want to listen to traditions, those traditions that I mentioned, and those philosophies in the office, you are inviting a defeated fella to be in charge of your life. I, Evans, I want to surrender mine to Jesus that he may continue controlling and driving me and granting me victory and freedom every step of the way. Amen? I want you to go and read verse 16 and verse 17 where Paul only says, enjoy that freedom. He says, enjoy that freedom. Because you've been set free, you've been granted victory, let no one pass judgment on you. Because whatever they are bringing are just shadows. But the real victory is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. May we rise up. May we rise up for prayer. Just open up your hands, everyone. Open to your two hands like this towards heaven, towards the sky. Just put two hands like this. Put them together like this. Just receive. At whatever point, just agree with me as I pray over each one of you. I'll not ask anyone to come up here, but if you feel you want to be forgiven, if you feel you want to give your life to Christ, as you end this service, you'll come here. I'll be present with the ministers here. We'll be praying with you. May we pray. Thank you, Father, because you've given us your son, Jesus Christ, to be our object of salvation. We repent in instances where we have allowed the things of this world to control us. Forgive us, dear Lord where philosophies and religious regulations have taken a toll on us, Lord, may you forgive us. And I pray that the salvation you've given us in your son Jesus Christ may have a practical effect in us, that we'll never fear the devil again, but we'll live knowing that you are the one who has purchased victory for us, and Satan is a defeated human, a defeated fella who will not do us anything. So we release ourselves to you, dear Lord. And cancel every code that the enemy may be using to claim access into our lives in the blessed name of Jesus Christ. We pray for release and we pray for victory over everyone who may have been put under the hands of the enemy. So may you receive, each one of you, your forgiveness. May you receive your freedom. May you receive victory that our Lord Jesus Christ offers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.